All right, you guys, let's go. Are we ready? Uh, we are ready. Okay, let's uh, let's begin. Welcome everyone to the eBible Fellowship panel discussion about Brother Campion's book, "To God Be the Glory." But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the Lord's Day. We thank you for your Word, the Bible, Father. There's a, there is no book like the Bible, and never will be. Because we know God's elect no people knows that the Bible is the word of God. And Father, we're not putting any book above the Bible. But as we read this book, Father, the Bible is the authority and not the writings of men. Dear Father, we thank you for each one of us here. And may you continue to open our understanding to the truths of your word, the Bible. And oh, Father, as though we're living in this day of judgment, we, we know that you're in perfect control of all things. And all things, O oh Lord, are, are working out according to your perfect plan. And may all praise and glory go to thee. We ask to be with us during this, this, this panel discussion. And we thank you for each and every one of the, the speakers today. And may you bless, O oh Lord, thy words to the hearts of thine elect. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in chapter five of Brother Camping's book, To God Be the Glory. And the title of that chapter is, chapter five is God's Judgment Plan. As you read through Brother Camping's book in chapter five at the top of the page, Mr. Camping start by saying that there in the first paragraph, now that we have been able abled by the mercy of God to know more clearly the judgment plan of God. And Mr. Camping goes on to speak about how that all our conclusions must be uh, to, to must be based on the Bible because uh, the Bible is the word of God. And that's how we look at this book. This book is not the authority that is written by Mr. Camping, but the Bible is the authority. And Mr. Camping goes on, go on in, in that book. In the first paragraph, he says, we must be sure that all our conclusions have come from the Bible and are entirely harmonious with all that is taught in the Bible. Then he goes on to tell us how the world was created in 11,013 BC and how he goes on to say that Christ, he is the one who created the universe. And he also writes that when God created the universe, he knew that man would rebel against him and he already had made provisions for his elect people to be saved through Christ, through Christ's sacrifice. And he goes on to tell us, like if you would open our Bibles and, and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, I was reading this verse. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, where there God writes, for, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, which is the work of Christ. And you, say, you see the same great truth there. You turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Reading was one verse in verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. There he read, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So you see there, Christ, when he was on the cross, he wasn't paying for sin. He had already done it from the foundation of the world. And Mr. Camping uh, went on to write uh, in the next paragraph there, it says, in the second line from the third paragraph where Mr. Camping writes in his book, God knew 
that soon after creation, mankind would disobey him. And he, he made provision for a portion of the human race that eventually would have come forth from our first parents, Adam and Eve. So wonderfully, God had done that. He says, it's not as if God didn't know that man would sin against him. He already had made provision for it. And uh, Mr. Camping goes on to write that how God kept in the last paragraph there at, on page 39 of chapter 5, how God kept the world going for over 13,000 years, basically for one purpose, this is to save his elect, for his perfect will to be done. And that is so true. And also, Mr. Camping made a few points about that. He says, um, when Adam and Eve sinned, that he quoted from, let's turn to Romans chapter 5. If you turn over your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Mr. Camping made a very good point there about, about man's rebellion against God. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And there we read, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, which was Adam, and death by sin, so death pass upon all men, for that all have sinned. And that is every human being that would ever be born into this world, where Adam is our foreparents, and because of his disobedience, death passed upon all of us. Not one single human being is, 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 uh, all of us is under this curse, this curse of God's wrath because of our sin. And that God really should have cut us all off from his wonderful grace. And by God's mercy, he didn't. But at the top of that page in the first paragraph, there in the two lines down from the paragraph on page chapter 40, there, Mr. Camping writes, and also we receive the sentence of physical death at the moment Adam and Eve sinned, and yet God provided for the fact that all were to all were to remain physically alive and have a functioning soul or spirit essence for a length of time that ended anywhere from immediately after the con conception to after more than 900 years of physical existence. So that's how Adam and Eve lived, how long they lived after they have sinned against God, because I believe Adam lived to be 930 years, so he didn't physically die at the moment when they sinned against God. God kept the human race going for his own purposes. And he goes on to, Mr. Camping goes on to make some more uh, uh, uh points about that he goes on to speaks about how god's elect is given life in christ you know and that's the only way we could have uh eternal life which through christ because that's why god's price paying for the sins of his elect are so important because if he didn't do that none of us would have any hope so god knew from the beginning that man would sin and he made provision god himself came into this world to pay for the sins of his elect and he goes on to make a few more points uh in uh if you look at first john chapter one let's turn up to first john chapter one uh mr camping quoted this verse in first john chapter one let's turn there chapter first john chapter one verse chapter Chapter 3, excuse me, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. And there we read where God says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Which here he's speaking of God's elect, that, that their sin, God took, it, took upon himself their sin, so in our soul existence where God we experience salvation, we don't sin. But you know, we have a body that 
is not saved as yet, so and the potential lies within the true believer's body to commit sin. But by God's mercy, you know, he helps us each day to live a life that is God glorifying to him. And Mr. Campaign goes on to write you know, how he speaks about he speaks about the non-elect that um they just have a functioning soul in them, he calls it, in uh in his book, which I thought was a very good term that he uses, because they God gave them they have the breath of life in them, but in their soul existence, they're spiritually dead. And he used spiritual dead to Mr. Camping used spiritually dead to talks about they have a non functioning soul in them which is dead so so you see how the, the wicked of the world is they're dead in trespasses and sins and the only way that they become they can become alive in their spirit is unless god save them and give them a brand new resurrected soul but we know that we're living in a day where god is no longer saving anyone the wicked will remain in their sin the unjust will remain unjust and the righteous will remain righteous because God is no longer saving anybody. The door to salvation is closed. And Mr. Kempin goes on in the in uh, the book to write in the final last uh the last paragraph in the book on page 40, there he writes, furthermore, by the means of the Bible, God gives mankind all the details of his merciful plan to rescue those whom he had elected to salvation. And, and indeed, it, it is a wonderful salvation plan to rescue his elect from eternal to be damnation, which is to be destroyed forever. And he goes on to write, because we are living very near the end of time, God is now revealing many details that describe his plan for the closing years and the final days of history. In the book, we must also we we are, we are almost there. We have set forth strictly from the Bible the precise timetable of each closing event, and that is how he 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 ends it here on page uh, uh, forty of his book. So I'll stop here and let the next uh, speaker uh, picks up on the next page. Thank you, Robert. Can everyone hear me? Can, you hear, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear All right. you. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, I'm going to start at the top of page 41. Harold Camping talks about the uh, nine, 1955 years of the duration of the church age, which began in, in AD 33, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the church age began. And the end of the church, the church age ended in AD 1988. He points out the fact that um, in AD 1988, God had finished that aspect of using the churches uh, in his salvation program. It was at that time God began to prepare the churches and the world for the end time events for judgment as he placed Satan in all the churches and allowed him to rule in the churches and throughout the world. God had long ago at the beginning of the church age warned them if they didn't repent, he would come and judge them. We read in uh, Revelation 3.3, 3, it, it, re it reads, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. We also read in Revelation 2.21, which reads, And I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. God gave the churches space to repent of their fornication, that is, their false doctrines throughout the entirety of the church age. And as a result, God judged them during the Great Tribulation. God also commanded the churches in Revelation 3.3 3, to watch. Uh, God established his, his people as watchmen who carefully watch in the scriptures and in the proper time and season. The Lord opened up his word to reveal the time, timing of his coming. God sets his people as watchmen. We read of, it, read of that in Ezekiel 33, 7, which reads, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, 
and warn them from me. We, we read of uh, the churches being un unfaithful watchmen. The reason I'm bringing all this up is, you know, God is just in, in the way that he judged the church. We, we read of the churches uh, being unfaithful watchmen in Isaiah 56.10, which reads, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. As a result, God will come like a thief and use Satan as an instrument to judge the church. We read, uh, we read in Matthew 24, 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And it's at that time the elect were driven out. We read of uh, this idea of the elect being driven out in John 16, 1, which reads, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God good service. The synagogues are a figure of the churches as illustrated by the church of Smyrna in Revelation 2, 9. This was the period of the latter reign when God's elect are driven out of the churches and congregations of the world, which is equivalent to them being killed. God's judgment process began first on the churches. We read in 1 Peter 4, 17. We're all familiar with these verses, but it's good to read them. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Harold Camping cites Revelation 3, 17 as a verse that illustrates Satan's freedom to help sin multiply, not only in the churches, but also in the world. We read in Revelation 13, 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power or authority was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The Great Tribulation period was a period of 8,400 days from May 21, 1988, to May 21, 2011. Harold Camping points out that the first 2,300 days, May 21, 1988, to September 7, 1994, virtually no one, no one became saved. I like to look at Revelation 8, 1, which calls this uh, a period of silence. We read in Revelation 8, 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. In this verse, God opened the seventh and final seal, which would mean the entire book, the Bible, is open. Then it talks about there being silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. When it says about the space of half an hour, it's indicating the first part of the Great Tribulation. When we search the Bible, when there is silence in heaven, it's indicating that no one is being saved. The contrary is when there is noise or activity illustrated by joy in heaven. It, it was indicating salvation was possible. We read of an account that speaks of joy in heaven in Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. Also, verses uh, 11 through 25, they count the prodigal son, and uh, we see music and dancing picturing spiritual activity of salvation. Silence in heaven would mean joy in heaven has ceased. This period of silence ceased on September 7th, 1994, which is a jubilee year when God again began to evangelize the gospel outside of the churches and congregations of the world, thus beginning the period of the latter reign, the last 6,100 days of the great tribulation, when God would save a great multi multitude which no man could number. We read in Revelation 7, 9 of this great multitude, and after this I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the land, clothed with, with white robes and palms in their hands. Then the question is asked, whence came they in verse 13? The answer is given in verse 14. Let's read those verses. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The last paragraph of page 41 
Harold Camping talks about God's salvation program coming to an abrupt end on May 21, 2011, and God's elect being raptured at that point. But we have learned from our vantage point that didn't take place because judgment, we thought, that would happen in a physical way, happened spiritually. We can prove this with a few verses, uh, like uh, we read in the account of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 through 3, where it speaks of sudden destruction. This word sudden is translated as unawares in Luke 21, 34. We also read in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, which speaks of they that are alive and remain shall be caught up, speaking of the resurrection. We also read in Isaiah 24, 6, the inhabitants of the earth are burn, burned, meaning God has judged the earth, and few men, that is, the elect, remain. Harold Camping also talks about October 21, 2011 being the final destruction of the world, but we have learned that the five months were, were also to be understood spiritually. Much biblical evidence is pointing to 2033 as the end of all things. Chris McCann is currently doing a series titled Biblical Evidence for the End in 2033. Chris has just completed part 75, and I would recommend listening to that series because Chris has outlined a lot of information in those studies. There's two things i like to point out, although uh, we had an incorrect understanding of what would happen on May 21, 2011 and the preceding five-month period. How made a point to emphasize in the first couple paragraphs of page 42 that there will be no mercy with the elect are now declaring that the door is shut. The Bible teaches that there will be judgment without mercy in James chapter 2, verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy. Kyle Campy also points out that, the de that death will be in evidence everywhere. Due to the nature of a spiritual judgment, only God's elect have eyes and I think Harold Campy, uh, uh, he was thinking in a physical way when he said there would be evidence of death everywhere. We all thought in, in a literal way that uh, Judgment Day would happen on May 21. The elect would be raptured and then there will be physical, literal uh, bodies uh, all, all over the earth. But uh, due to the nature of the spiritual of, of, of Judgment Day, only God's elect have eyes to see the evidence of death through the Bible. We read in Psalms chapter 37, verse 34, which reads, Wait on Jehovah and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. And this is speaking of the elect. And we only see, we have eyes of faith we see in, in the scriptures. Uh, and I have another verse that's uh, 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 read in, in a slightly different way. In Psalms chapter nine, 91, verses 7 and 8, which reads, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come, it shall not come nigh thee. Verse 8, only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Then how Camping uh, uh, correctly uh, gives us 2 Peter 3.10 as a verse that uh, um, uh, describes the, the, uh, the, the uh, final day of earth's existence. We read, uh, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. In the second paragraph on page 42, Harold Camping says, As God has taught us more and more clearly the details of God's rescue plan, we have learned from the Bible that the people of the world can be divided up into several groups. These groups are as follows. Uh, I think it would be redundant to uh, get into the five groups because the next speaker uh, is going to uh, get into it. But maybe I'll just read. Uh, the five groups are, number one, those who are not elect, that is, those who were not chosen to be saved and will never become saved have died before Judgment Day. The second group, those who are elect, those whom God must save because they, are, they were chosen to be saved who are living but have not yet become saved. The third group, those who are elect and have become saved and are presently living in this world. The fourth group, those who are non-elect and have not died. And the fifth group, those who are elect and have died. The next speaker will discuss in more details these five groups of people. I'll close and get a discussion to the next speaker, Stephen. 
Thanks, Oliver. So uh, I'm going to pick up on chapter five where Oliver left off, beginning on the bottom of page 42. So I'm going to go through some of these groups of people, um, save for the last one. Um, the first group that uh, Capping speaks of are the non-elect uh, who died before the day of judgment. Um, there are two groups of people actually that Capping speaks of here. Uh, they're both the they're the non-elect and the elect. But then camping, he breaks them up into subgroups. So there are um, subgroups of the non-elect and then the elect that he uh, he talks about. So these groups mainly consist of two groups, uh, which are the elect, the non-elect. Uh, and then uh, camping goes on to explain how God's judgment and salvation program applies to them throughout history and in the day of judgment. At the end of page 42, he goes on to list this first group of people who are the non-elect. And uh, this group um, have lived out their lives throughout the history of the world. And they have died before Judgment Day came upon the world. They were not of those whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And thus they were never predestinated unto salvation. This group of people lived out their lives in the world without ever realizing that their death was a shameful execution in the eyes of God for their sins. Camping goes on to speak more of about this group. And um, he says, each time they sinned, they shamed God and brought themselves further under the curse of God. Moreover, when they died, they may have had some sorrow that they could no longer enjoy the good things of this world. However, if they died in an accident or in their sleep, they did not even experience their loss. They did not realize that their death meant that it was absolutely impossible that they would ever receive the magnificent inheritance that could have been theirs because they were created to be the sons of God. Thus, even though these people died without any awareness of the huge penalty that they paid for their sins, it did not change the fact that they did pay the penalty. And that penalty was the loss of their birthright. That is the kingdom of God. This vividly demonstrates the magnificent mercy of God. And uh, it really does um, show um, the mercy of God because not only did God allowed the unsaved throughout history to die, not understanding the magnitude of their loss of this inheritance they were created with when Adam sinned. But among those unsaved who died, many of them were self-professed Christians who were not part, uh, they were part of a church, uh, but they had never truly become saved. They believed they were saved because they accepted Christ and they took their last breath with the expectation that they would soon be in heaven, not knowing that they too, uh, like the unsaved of the world, were under the judgment of God and would never receive the blessing of eternal life. And Camping goes on to speak to this loss of the inheritance. Um, he points out that because everyone was created in Adam, our first parent, we were effectively created with the birthright of the firstborn. And that birthright included the inheritance of eternal life. However, at the same time, it was conditional. And this parallels the situation with the historical account of the parable of Jacob and Esau. If Esau had not sinned by rejecting his birthright, uh, which was his by the right of having been physically the firstborn, that birthright would have been, uh, it would have remained his. Likewise, had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would have forever retained the birthright. They would have never been cast out of the kingdom of God as they did in the day that they sinned. And with the story of Jacob and Esau, we see this spiritual picture in view to teach the lesson that since mankind typified by Esau despised his birthright, God ended up orchestrating events in order to find someone else who would receive the right of the firstborn or the inheritance. Historically, that person is Jacob, but spiritually, 
it is all of God's elect who are in the Lord Jesus Christ and it is Christ who is heir or seed that inherits the promised land. In Hebrews 1 verse 2, God tells us that Christ is heir of all things, but also the elect are counted for the seed in Christ so that they become the sons of God or heirs. Uh, for example, in Romans 8 verse 17, God refers to the elect as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And as sons of God and joint heirs, the elect are given the inheritance. They are those who will inherit the new heavens and the new earth to reign with Christ as co-heirs, just as God purposed from the very beginning. And so we can see that while Esau was the firstborn, God set an order of events to unfold so that Jacob would be the supplanter. Thus, it was all the elect who are counted for the seed in Christ who received the right of the firstborn or the inheritance, which mankind typified by Esau despised. Also, uh, in the historical parable of Esau, um, which Camping speaks to, you really do see how little Esau valued the birthright to trade it in for something as insignificant and temporal as a bowl of pottage. And that's essentially the add to the unsaved that the world have towards salvation, as Camping points out on this page. Um, God has been so good to the unsaved in allowing them to live out their lives to pursue sinful pleasures in this world that they place more value on trying to obtain fulfillment in those pleasures and the temporal things of this world, such as fame and uh, riches, more so than the only thing that is not temporal, but is ever enduring, which is salvation. And also everything that comes with salvation, it includes every unspeakable thing that awaits God's elect who receive this eternal inheritance. And even the best that man has to offer in this world can't begin to compare to this unspeakable gift. And while the unsaved did lose the inheritance that they were created with through Adam's sin, they do also have another kind of inheritance in a sense uh, in this world, which consists of all the material and temporal things which appeal to the lust of the flesh and the eyes the riches, the fame, the pursuit of sinful pleasure that all the unsaved seek after. This is their very short-lived and temporal inheritance. Uh, in Matthew 6, verse seven, uh, chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, God reminds us about not laying up treasures upon the earth, which are subject to corruption, but rather God reminds us, uh, the elect, to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Um, there's deeper spiritual truth of this passage, but we do see that it is the mentality of the unsaved to store up their riches on earth where those things are subject to corruption. And at best, all these riches they labor for, uh, they pass down to their families and their friends, but yet these riches cannot deliver them uh, from death. So ultimately, all that they labor for is in vain and all that they accomplished and labored uh, for will vanish away with everything else that is temporal and subject to corruption in this world. And sadly, while they live out their lives in pursuit of sinful pleasure, they are still never fully satisfied. They spend their lives envying their neighbor for having material possessions, which they do not have. Yet their hatred, their love of this world, and their envy will go to the grave with them. As uh, God reminds us in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 6, he says, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Uh, and this has been the life cycle of all the unsaved who have lived their life and died throughout history uh, before the day of judgment. On page 43, Camping speaks of the second group of people, and these are the elect who have not yet become saved. Uh, at the time of writing this, it was still a day of salvation. So Camping emphasized that this group of people still had to become saved prior to judgment day, just like the unsaved who remained alive at the time, uh, at that time, and now into the day of judgment, these two elect, these elect uh, also were spiritually dead because although God paid for their sins in eternity past, that shed blood was not yet applied to them uh, by God saving them or giving them a new resurrected soul. The Bible also refers to this process as being born again in John 3, verse 3. So Camping points out that because their sins had already been paid for through Christ's atoning work in eternity past, 
they must receive a pardon by God before they physically die or before judgment day comes on May 21, 2011. And this goes back to page 38, where Camping speaks of criminals being pardoned for their crimes at the 11th hour, just as Christ pardoned the elect thief on the cross who was next to him just moments before his death when Christ heard some of the most beautiful sounding words, uh, this thief on the cross or any of God's elect could ever hear reminding him that on the, that very same day, he would also be, uh, he would be with him forevermore in paradise. And as camping correctly points out, this group of all of the elect who were not yet saved were collectively pardoned, receiving the salvation of their souls by the time the great tribulation ended and judgment day began. The Bible speaks of this group of elect as coming out of great tribulation with ropes made white by the blood of lamb in Revelation 7, verse 14, where we read, and I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. In this passage, we read of the great multitude of God's elect that come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and they are said to not hunger or thirst anymore. This language is uh, pointing to what happens when God's elect become saved. They have obtained Christ's righteousness through salvation and therefore no longer hunger nor thirst after righteousness. But then it says that the Lamb shall feed them who are no longer hungry and shall lead them to fountains of living water. It doesn't make sense to feed those who are no longer hunger unless we understand what God is teaching here spiritually. And the Bible teaches that after the great multitude are saved out of the great tribulation, it is God's purpose to feed all his sheep. For example, in John 21, we read of the great catch of fish that are caught in the net, pointing to the great multitude God had saved out of the great tribulation period. And after they are drawn to shore, God tells his disciples to feed his sheep and to, to give living waters equates to feeding sheep spiritually. And this is um, this feeding of sheep is accomplished by God's elect obediently as they declare his word to the world so that his sheep are among them that are fed by God through his word. And lastly, on page 44, Camping refers to the group of people who are saved and presently living in the world and those who are unsaved and are presently living in the world come judgment day. Camping points out that the elect who are alive will be raptured on May 21, while the unsaved who are alive go into the day of judgment where they are subject to death and will likely die at some point within the five-month period or on the last day. Uh, as we've already pointed out, camping was incorrect in um, the sense that there would be a, a physical judgment throughout this period of time. Um, people can, anyone who's interested in that can go back to previous discussions where we've already laid that out. But um, uh, one passage that, um, one thing that camping was correct about was that there was a prolonged judgment period and it did begin on May 21, and we just had the order of events uh, incorrect so that the rapture and the resurrection would happen on the very last day of Judgment Day. And um, one passage that speaks of this period of time uh, is in Isaiah 24, which details this period of Judgment Day for this group of people who go through judgment. Uh, the inhabitants of the earth are burned with a spiritual fire that has been kindled in God's wrath as he brings the day of judgment upon the world, and yet it is only the unsaved inhabitants of the world who are burned with this fire. God then speaks of another group of people. Uh, these are the elect who are alive and remain as 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says. These elect are the few men that are left because they are the remnant of those who have been saved uh, or chosen unto salvation. God reminds us in Matthew 22, verse 14, that many will be called and few will be chosen. So while God does refer to them as a great multitude, uh, because if we strictly go by numbers, God did save a great number of people. Uh, at the same time, in comparison to the number of those who are unsaved, um, they are a very small remnant. And so the earth has 
being spiritually burned up and the great number of unsaved who are alive, including many who have uh, been called but never chosen unto salvation, um, are burned up. And the only, all those who are left are the remnant of God's elect. Uh, they remain intact, such as C- Cedrach, uh, Shishak, Meshach, and Abednego did when they were cast into the fiery furnace. And yet we're not burned at all. Uh, God's people will come forth as gold and silver is purified and will not be harmed by this spiritual fire, which will burn up all the unsaved as dross. And this is why Malachi 4 verse 1, um, in that chapter, God refers to judgment day as a day which will burn as an oven where all the wicked and proud are burned up. Uh, this is what is taking place spiritually at this time uh, for this group of people who are unsaved and alive and go through this day of judgment. And uh, this is the last group that Camping speaks of on this page. And there's one other group, but I think uh, Bobby will go over that. I'll end here. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we're gonna be looking at pages 44 to 47. Uh, which is the last section for tonight. It's called The Resurrection of the Unsaved Dead. And here, after establishing that God's judgment plan is one of annihilation, um, we read, um, he goes through three passages that seem to imply that the unsaved dead will live again. Um, The first one is Acts 24, verse 15, where it says, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And we've learned that resurrection really means rising. And here in this uh, verse, we read about two groups, you know, the just and the unjust. So we see that with this first verse, it's, you know, and and the ones that are going to follow, they're, they're snares because we can draw a wrong conclusion from this. The next one is John 5, verse 28, uh, where it says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. And that word damnation in the Greek is Strong's 2920, it's the Greek word crisis. We can see we get the word crisis from that. It's normally translated as judgment. If you go through and look, um, like you'll see in Matthew 10, where it mentions the day of judgment, it's, it's that same word. So it's the resurrection or the rising of damnation or the rising of judgment. And so the question is, how do the unsaved dead hear the voice of God? And to explain this, um, Mr. Camping goes to turns to Ezekiel 37, and uh, I'll read verse 5, where it says, Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Jehovah. So the dead, um, both the elect and the non-elect, will hear the voice of the Lord on the last day, of earth's existence. Um, and like in, in Mark 4, when Jesus is out, is out on the ship and the storm comes and he comes out and he rebukes the wind and the wind and the, and the sea obey the command of Jesus. Uh, Mr. Camping notes on page 46, I'm going to quote from that, in order for the wind and the waves to obey the command of Jesus, they had to be awake to hear his voice. Likewise, the dead bones and the remains of the unsaved can be awakened to hear the voice of God without literally becoming alive. And then one last passage that seems to infer that the unsaved dead will live again is Daniel 12, verse 2. And Daniel 12, verse 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And the unsaved unsaved awake 
by, ri by rising out of the graves on the last day. Um, as Mr. Camping notes, also on page 46, it is a resurrection to shame and contempt. And shame is an aspect of the punishment, which I want to look at. So now judgment day and shame. Um, Mr. Camping quotes Nahum 3 verse 5. Uh, to show this, uh, I'll read that verse. Behold, I am against thee, saith Jehovah of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. And then, not quoted in the book, but another good verse that shows the same uh, issue or same um, shame and judgment day is Isaiah 41. I'll read verses 1 and 3. Isaiah 47, 1, and when it mentions Babylon, we know Babylon's a picture of the world in, in the day of judgment. Isaiah 47, 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And then verse 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen, I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. And so, as we've learned that, you know, worldly institutions are the target of God's wrath in the day of judgment, like if you, in the uh, Why is the World So Divided track on the first panel, it goes through this, mentioning how the news media, once trusted, is now being put to shame, or it's being shamed and humiliated. Uh, the entertainment industry has been hit by many scandals sports you know it's also there's been shame in that area the world's religions the scientific community and also the educational system and the justice system um we're seeing this more and more and we will continue to see this okay and a, an interesting point that uh mr camping makes on page 45, he writes, shame on the okay. unsaved. This is over to you were pretty soon. I got Excuse the, me, Guy. You're the uh, thing on. As soon as it's over. Could I'll you guys could, could you guys mute Guy? Okay. Okay. Um one of the interesting things that Mr. Camping uh writes oh, okay, good. on page 45 is yeah. that mm -hmm. Okay. Can you guys can you guys mute? Him? All right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the interesting thing that Mr. Camping writes on page 45 is shame on the unsaved continues all the way to the last day of this world's existence. And even though the way Mr. Camping was thinking about this was that it would be a time of shame from uh, you know, May 21st, 2011 to October 21st, 2011. But he really got this right, even though the understanding was incorrect at that time with the bodies and everything. But shame is a key aspect of the Day of Judgment. And I just wanted to share, in closing, I wanted to share something that Chris had wrote um, a little less than seven years ago, where he wrote, um, in the days to come, we can expect that any organization or institution or philosophy that identifies with the world will be exposed to ridicule. It will lose respect and honor and be brought low. This happens to all who are the objects of God's wrath. And that was an article called The World, The Object of God's Wrath Exposed and Publicly Ridiculed. And that's going to be it for me. That concludes our presentations. And now we can open it up for discussion. Hey, hey Bobby, you pointed out that in Daniel 12, too, that um, the uh, waking has to do with the rising. And I uh, just wanted to uh, um, show you... Um, here in uh, Daniel 12, 2, this word awake is Strong's number 6974, as you can see there. And it's the same word just translated as arise in um, 
Psalm 44, 23, which reads, Awake, that's a different word. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, that's the same word. So this would agree what, what you were saying about the resurrection has to do with arising. This word awake has to do with arising. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thanks. I didn't know that. I never looked that up. Also, um, I personally just wanted to give some words of encouragement. Uh, I think uh, uh, Stephen talked about how um, the people of the world typified by Esau uh, who gave up their birthright for a bowl of soup. I just like to give some encouraging verses like First um, John uh, two fifteen, which reads, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the, lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world." And also, we see the account of the the, the rich man and Lazarus who, who had all the things. Uh, all the uh, uh, inheritance that the world presented him. Uh, he, he had many uh, riches. Uh, he enjoyed the pleasures of this world. And yet at the end, uh, the roles are reversed. Uh, the, um, the beggar was the one who, who had the spiritual riches. So I would just like to encourage people as far as that. Yeah. Um, in Ecclesiastes, uh, to to elaborate more on what you're you're talking about uh, Oliver that verse in Ecclesiastes where um God speaks of the hatred and uh the love uh which the unsaved take with them to the grave in Ecclesiastes yeah. 9 verse 6 I was looking up the Hebrew word um that's translated there as their envy uh that's Strong's number H 1571 and it's it's a word that's translated mostly as jealousy. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew root word, which is uh, strong seventy sixty five. And uh, this word, the majority of the time, it's also translated as jealous and envy. And it's used in Psalm thirty seven verse one, where um, and Chris did a study on this on um, in Psalms thirty seven verse one to two where it says fret not thyself because of evil doers neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and whether it's a green herb um so you know god's reminding us to not be envious of the wicked uh because they will soon be cut down like the grass and uh this is the same word that's used there in uh or it's the root word of the the word that's used here in ecclesiastes verse nine to six um where um it speaks of of their envy uh which they take to the grave so yeah the unsaved they they spend their lives envying one another and and it's it's really amazing because <clears throat> they you know god gives the unsaved quite a lot in this world um a lot of blessings uh he allows them to pursue their sinful pleasures but even then they're they're not fully satisfied and so in a sense, they trade in um, the hope of salvation. Of course, God always knew who the elect were, but from man's vantage point, there was always a hope um, that they could seek God in, in hope of salvation. And they trade that in uh, for the pleasures of sin. But the thing is, these pleasures that they seek, they're still not satisfied with. So they trade it in for something far greater than sin, but even when they trade it in, they're still not satisfied. And that's that's really sad because if you think like uh, you make a trade with someone, right? Like you barter with someone on something, normally you want equal value, right? If, if you trade with someone like you give, you sell them the car of yours for something of equal value, you want to walk away from that transaction feeling like you have, you received equal value that you're satisfied with that transaction. But with sin, it's not like that. With sin, people are, they just want more of it. And that's the nature of sin, that they're never fully satisfied with it. And yeah. that's um, that's the end of the unsaved is that they take that to the grave with them. Um, 
So that's a reminder of us why God tells us in Psalm 37 to uh, not be envious of, of the wicked. Yeah, there's that verse in Ecclesiastes about how the eye is not satisfied with seeing. I think it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. See if I can find that. Let's see. Yeah, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 8, all things are full of labor, men cannot utter it, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. And it's true, it's just, um, there's never any true satisfaction in the world. They're, they're never satisfied with whatever it is that they have. Or if they are, it's just for a short moment, and then it's taken for granted, and then it's really not appreciated anyway. Yeah, I've often I've often been told, uh, man, you gotta live a little, you know. It's uh, you know, and people they just don't understand. You know, God commands us. He says uh, in Revelation eighteen, I heard another voice from heaven saying, "Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues." So you know, the elect child of God is going the opposite direction. They're pulling away from the things of the world, and uh, people kind of look at you when. Uh, they, they um, say, man, you got to live a little bit. Uh, you're not living, you know. And it, the unsaved person, they don't, they, doesn't, they don't realize that, you know, what they call living is not living, you know. It's not really living. It's going contrary to God's word. And uh, yeah. that, that brings about death, which is uh, very sad. Yeah, they're not living according to their definition because the child of God is commanded to bear his cross, to sacrifice his right. flesh, right? So we're not living um, after the flesh because we are to sacrifice, to crucify the flesh. Um, and that's our reasonable service is to crucify the flesh. So, um, you know, if, if we're living like the world is living, then we should be asking ourselves, are we truly saved? Because that the, the, the life of a true believer is a life of sacrifice. Right. And um, that's only because God first made that sacrifice. And as a result, um, you know, we are to sacrifice the flesh uh, by taking up our cross. Um, the world doesn't understand that. And the world, it, it's, it's interesting because they do, there is some wisdom in the sense when they say you only live once, right? But they don't say it in the sense of being humble and living each day like it's their lives. What they mean by that is, to get every uh, drop out of the bowl of soup, mm -hmm. right, as yeah. possible. And that's really sad because it's like all those experiences, all the pleasures of life, you're not going to remember them when you die. You can't take them to the grave with you. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas God's elect, you know, what they're sacrificing, what they're crucifying the flesh for is something that they can take with them uh, after they die, which is the hope of e everlasting life. It's a, a everlasting hope that they have. And um, they go into eternity future with that. Well said. It's almost eight o'clock. So okay. they're having uh, the uh, interview time. So. And let's close with a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this discussion about thy word, the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that you have opened up thy word to the hearts of your elect people. And it's a great blessing, Father. We thank you for your written word, the Bible. The Bible is absolute truth. The Bible is the word of God. And, oh, Lord, thy word is truth. And whatever you have declared in your word, you will bring it to pass. I pray for all of us who are listening. And, oh, Lord, we thank you for this time of discussing this book. We thank you for raising up Brother Camping. And now you've taken him home to be with you. And we have this great hope that very soon, O oh Lord, we'll, all of your elect will be in thy presence forevermore. Father, could it be your will to bring us here back again on another Lord's Day to discuss thy word, the Bible? And may all praise and glory goes to thee. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Okay, just wanted to know, uh, there will be no panel discussion next week because there will be a day in the Word. So, Lord willing, we'll be back in two weeks on Sunday, March 31st to continue.